Welcome to this episode of This Week in British History with me, Philippa Lacey Brule. If you love history, then you are definitely in the right place. So go ahead and hit subscribe. This week, we're talking about the birth of Mary, Queen of Scots and her ascension to the throne only six days later, and also the abdication crisis of Edward VIII. While you're with me, please let me tell you about two other history projects that I think you might find interesting. The first one is called 2020 is History. It will be one day, very soon, hopefully. And you can check out the details of that on 2020ishistory.com. What it basically is, in a nutshell, is capturing the voices of ordinary people living through 2020. As historians, as people who are interested in history, you're probably aware that the voices of ordinary people generally are missing in any kind of history narrative because probably, you know, they're on, they're getting on with their day a lot of the time, or, you know, it's down to practical reasons that people couldn't read and write, that just down to could they get hold of writing materials, have those writing materials survived, all of this. And you would think that in 2020, it's going to just be easy. One of those things, everyone's everyone's voices will be captured in 2020 and I think that is a trap that we could fall into because what are those dinner table conversations what are people saying to each other privately they're not being captured unless we make an effort to do so otherwise we will still just have the voices of the powerful the rich the public the people with the big voices and so 2020 is history is collating people's voices and you can submit a, uh, your voice your what you want to say anywhere between one and a thousand words and more if you get on a roll that's fine and you can submit it as anonymously as you like and by that i mean there could be no detail about who you are um, or where you're from and you can do different layers of anonymity if you like it it's totally up to you you put it on the submission that you put in you could put your age you could put where you're from you could put your um, profession you could put your family structure whatever it is that you think maybe perhaps gives context to what you're writing and you are happy that is going to be um, recorded then you can include that right through so if you want to put your name on you can also do that that's absolutely fine but that's what I mean by it's going to be anonymous so 2020 is history is for absolutely everybody so if you would like to contribute please do take a look at 2020ishistory.com and I'd also like to mention to you Brutal History. Brutal History is a new channel that myself and my good friend Catherine Brooks who can be found on Instagram and Facebook as the Tudor Tracker are doing together and it's going to be very much very fun it's going to be very informative but we're going to hit some of the topics that other channels possibly don't go into um, it could just be that we're slightly walked in mind but I actually think it's, it's it's more to do with just those those odd questions that you think well what did they do for that what Anyway, we're going to cover all sorts and we will take suggestions from the audience as well. So Brutal History, watch out for announcements about that. We are going to be launching that in 2021. On the 8th of December 1542, Mary of Guise gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Mary of Guise was the Queen Consort to James V of Scotland. Well, James V died only six days later and the new baby girl would be Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary's father, James V, had come to the throne when he was only one year old. So Scotland had been in this position before of having an infant monarch, but of course this was a double whammy. She was a baby and she was a she. And we're gonna wind the story back to 1503, when Henry VII sent his eldest daughter, Margaret, to marry James IV of Scotland. This was supposed to be, you know, a union of a marriage union, a personal union, which would help the two countries within the same island to get on a bit better. However, that was not going to last for very long. At the Battle of Flodden against the English in 1513, James IV was killed and James V came to the throne. Well, the two nations were at it again a few decades later and James V died after fighting the English at Solway Moss. He was only 30 years old and his successor 
was his six-day-old daughter, Mary. On hearing that his newborn child was a girl, James famously said, it came with a lass and it will pass with a lass. So I thought I'd take the opportunity today to tell you what James was meaning when he said that. So the first part of what James said, it came with a lass. Well, he was talking about the beginning of the Stuart dynasty. So it came with a female lass, a girl, a woman. And he was referring back to Marjorie Bruce. Marjorie Bruce was the daughter of Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland, and she had married Walter Stewart, the sixth uh, high steward of Scotland. At this point, let me tell you about the name Stewart because it could have been different. The family name had been Fitzalan, but the Fitzalans had had this role of high steward of Scotland. By the time Marjorie Bruce married Walter Stewart, he was the sixth steward of Scotland. So a few generations back, it had been changed from Fitzalan to steward because that had been their title, that had been their role in the, uh, in the royal household. And so they changed their name, steward became Stuart. And so James was referring back to Marjorie Bruce marrying Walter Stewart and their son had eventually become king. When Robert the Bruce died, the throne had passed to his son David, who became David II of Scotland. But when he died childless in 1371, the throne passed to the son of Walter Stewart and Marjorie. His name was Robert Stewart. So it was via Marjorie Bruce that the Stuarts became kings of Scotland. And so the second part of James's exclamation, it will pass with a lass. Well, he was wrong, but that's us looking back with hindsight. So did James actually just think, no, this is it, this is the end for the Stuart line, it's going to die out with my newborn daughter? But to be fair to James, he was living in a time where childhood mortality was high, he was far more familiar with death than he was with people surviving, and so his, the chances were that he genuinely would just have believed, for good reason, that the line, the Stuart line, was unlikely to continue. It required this six day old baby girl growing up and healthy, marrying and having children. We know that Mary grew up to be Queen of Scotland in her own right. She was Queen Consort of France for a time and she battled for her entire life to be named heir to the throne of England, which of course we know got her into a lot of trouble. We also know that she had children and it was her son, James VI, who was the first joint monarch of Scotland and England. And it is his line, or her line, but the Stuart line, which led to the union of Scotland and, uh, and England actually became the, um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And the Stuart line didn't die out until the 18th century with its last monarch, Queen Anne. And so James sadly died thinking that his death was going to lead to the end of the Stuart line. We know it didn't. Mary's story is well told. I have a number of different materials and videos that you can look up. I'll put links in the show notes for you to go and look at Mary's story as well. Um, I'm also running a tour on Mary Queen of Scots, which you can uh, check out the website britishhistorytours.com to have a look at. And also, if we run it again, which we probably will at some point, we do an executed Queen's tour, uh, which covers Mary Queen of Scots as well. It's very, very interesting. That was a great tour. And we talk about her relationship with Elizabeth because there's really, uh, it's very difficult to talk about one without the other. They were so influential on each other's lives despite the fact they, they never met. Now my next story is, is quite juicy. It is the abdication of Edward VIII. Now Edward VIII is one of the very few monarchs who never had a coronation. They are on the line of monarchs, on your ruler, ruler, if you have one, but he never had a coronation. And he signed his declaration of abdication on the 10th of December, 1536, at Fort Belvedere in Great Windsor Park. 1936 is known as the year of the three kings because it began with George V on the throne. George V died and Edward VIII became monarch. And by the end of the year, Edward VIII had abdicated and his younger brother, the Duke of York, became George VI. George VI is our current Queen's father. And so had his brother Edward VIII stayed on the throne and had legitimate children, 
then potentially we could have had a different royal family to the one that we have today. The abdication notice was witnessed by Edward's three younger brothers, Prince Albert, Duke of York, who would become George VI, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, and Prince George, Duke of Kent. Edward VIII was renouncing the throne of Britain. His full title at the time was, officially, by the grace of God of Great Britain, Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the seas, King, Defender of the Faith, Emperor of India. The following day, his abdication was given effect by a rushed through act of parliament. So what would be a reason powerful enough for a king to abdicate his throne? Love, of course. Edward wanted to marry American divorcee Wallace Simpson. She had already divorced one husband and she was in the middle of divorcing her second when he proposed that he was going to marry her. He maintained that he couldn't undertake the duties required of a king without the love and support of the woman that he loved. But this was a constitutional crisis. Nobody had abdicated the throne willingly before and this thrust the Duke of York into suddenly a new position of not being heir to the throne anymore, the second in line. He was now king. And if you've ever watched the King's Speech, the film The King's Speech, um, I find it really moving because he was obviously a very kind man. He seemed very family oriented and this thrust him suddenly into the limelight. He had his stutter, which he had to work on because of course he was going to need to address the, the country. And in fact, in Christmas week, I'm going to be talking about George VI doing the first Christmas address to the nation on the radio. So why wasn't Edward allowed to marry the woman that he chose? Well, Edward as head of state was also the head of the Church of England. And the Church of England did not at the time allow people to remarry in church unless their previous spouse had died. So not only was Edward not allowed to marry Wallace Simpson according to the church, but there were also political objections to the match. And many believed that Wallace Simpson's interest in Edward was more to do with money and position. However, the couple did remain married for the rest of his life. Wallace Simpson was also known to be a sympathiser for Nazi Germany and the chances that she would leak back information from British government was of course a huge concern. During the abdication, Wallace Simpson was in exile in France and her personal protection officers actually fed back that they were concerned that she may flip to Germany. After the abdication, the couple settled in France and once Wallace Simpson's divorce settlement had been reached, the couple married. Edward's new title was His Royal Highness the Duke of Windsor. His wife was the Duchess of Windsor, but was not allowed to use HRH. At the beginning of World War II, in September 1939, Edward was assigned to the British military mission in France. In the following February, the German ambassador at The Hague claimed that Edward had leaked Allied plans for the defence of Belgium. When Germany invaded the north of France in May 1940, the Duke and Duchess fled to Lisbon in Portugal. The Duke and Duchess were known to be supporters of Hitler and Nazi Germany. Lord Caldicott had warned Churchill that the Duke is well known to be pro-Nazi and he may well become a centre of intrigue. Churchill threatened the Duke with a court-martial if he did not return to British soil at that point. And in July 1940, Edward was appointed the Governor of the Bahamas. But he reportedly told an acquaintance, after the war is over and Hitler will crush the Americans, we'll take over. They, the British, don't want me as their king, but I'll be back as their leader. And he was reported also to have said, it would be a tragic thing for the world if Hitler was overthrown. Well, it was a good job for us all that Hitler was overthrown. Edward and Wallace remained in France for the rest of their lives in exile and forced retirement. Edward died there in 1972. And Wallace would outlive him by 14 years. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you will come and join me again soon. There are also plenty of other videos on my YouTube channel which you can go and check out. If you'd like to help support me then you can follow the link to make a donation in the show notes or you can visit paypal.me forward slash British History Tours or you can support me for free by just subscribing to this channel, liking the videos, sharing them and commenting on them. That helps get the word out, helps more people see the videos, helps me get more subscribers etc etc and it's just just, it's just fabulous and that is all of course free for you. 
But until next time, take care, have fun. I'll see you again soon. Marjorie, that, yeah. So it was via Marjorie the, Marjorie the Bruce. It was via Marjorie Bruce that a steward became the, so it was via, oh, for goodness sake. Edward, uh, there were also moral object, no. So not only, oh. so was, ah, oh, oh, it's children. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's made me all tear up. It's just a walking bus. The children are going home from school, I think. Oh, I just see kids together holding hands again. Ah! <laughs> oh, I'm just a big softie. All right, get rid of the tears. Uh, right, what am I doing?